All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Um, so we have what I think is going to be a pretty cool talk today, um, something a little bit different for us. Um, and that talk is going to be presented by Dr. Stephanie Hurst. Uh, she is an associate press professor and still an interim chair. I'm not uh, interim chair, no, thank God. Okay. That needs to be updated it's in a couple places. Oh yeah, several <laughs> places. That's fine. Uh, in chemistry at Northern Arizona, Arizona University, um, she is also for the Center of Quantum Networks, a Thrust Three researcher, and um, the director of diversity and culture of inclusion. So that's kind of going to be the the focus of what she's going to be talking about a little bit today. Is kind of. Uh, the other stuff besides research, but it's going to be a very valuable talk for us. So um, with that, Stephanie, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Russ. Let me just share my screen here. I also see all the names, of course, in the side. So do know that I am possibly going to be calling on people, whether you, I see your beautiful smiling faces, I see Marianne, I see you get am I pronouncing that badly I assume it's more like eat. eat eat I'll do my best oh of course I remember because you introduced yourself previously it's like as if you were to eat anyway long story short um this is a hopefully a more interactive talk I realize that of course that we have this very diverse range of people we've got some people of course from the CQN REUs and we've got other people from the IOU NA REUs as well and so we've really got a sort of a, a very diverse bunch here so I'm just going to sort of start to hop into this talk of course you've got the title you would have seen that and from here, what I want to do is I'd better introduce myself. Now, in theory, there was going to be two speakers today, but I'll explain why it's just me. Let me just uh, advance this slide. Did that slide advance? Just give me a thumbs up if it looks okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's always great to know. So who am I? My name is Stephanie Hurst. I'm uh, now a full professor at NAU. My background is in nonlinear optics. Um, basically lasers, um, you know, and making stuff essentially. Um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from America, I'm from Australia originally, and I came over initially on a postdoctoral position. Um, I'm now a full professor at Northern Arizona University. You can see the beautiful view, of course, in the background. But of course, if you do materials or if you work with lasers, you're inevitably stuck down in the basement of the building, of course. So in terms of what I do, um, I work on engineered materials, looking at creating materials with specific optical physical properties. I have some other interests that you can see there. And a lot of what I do is working with collaborations and also working with mentoring leadership. Now, I'd really hope to have my other speaker here today. She can't join us. She was an undergrad. And she was amazing and cool. And I miss Laura a whole bunch. She is now graduated from NAU. She was a first generation student and something that a lot of people might be able to empathize with. Uh, she's also going on to medical school, not immediately. She was actually awarded one of these NIH intramural research training grants. And she was my co-presenter when we gave a similar talk to this previously. Unfortunately, like I said, we've lost her to medical school, but you know, you never know when she might come back around. So what's this talk all about? Well, a lot of it is about DCI. Now, you would have heard from Russ over the summer all about EWD, and this is where I get to pick on people. Where are we? Oh, I, I see Marianne. Marianne, what's EWD again? I'll be, I'll be curious if they know this. I've actually not talked about EWD. Really? Okay. Yes, they just know me as the person who sends them emails and <laughs> about different things. So. Fair enough. Okay. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, well, e EWD is Education Workforce Development, of course. Well, we are the other side of that. We are from the centre, and the centre is of hopefully the people who are paying you from the DCI side of things. So we are Diversity, Culture of Inclusion, and this is coming out of NSF. Now, if you're thinking about going on to graduate school, maybe you already have that identified, 
NSF really puts a high priority on the social impacts. In fact, we have an entire thrust, thrust four, which is nothing than just how is this new quantum internet going to impact things? And so they make sure that it's not just about the science, it's about how this science is going to impact people on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you can read some of the description here, gaining mutual benefit. We want people to know that they are welcome. That's the inclusion part. And I know a lot of people saying, oh, that sounds like some pretty fluffy stuff. Actually, that's the more challenging part. Technical issues can be solved. Social issues may be with us forever. So even if you've never heard of this before, hopefully this is a chance where you are hearing who it is, people like me, and what we do. And we're not just people who work in diversity or in making this cultural inclusion, we're researchers as well. So that's kind of important where we're coming from. So that's the who of DCI and the what. Now, you're spending time listening to this talk, which I gratefully appreciate. I want to make sure that this talk is worth your time. And here's a quote which I took from Nature. Um, I'm a subscriber to Nature. A year into the coronavirus pandemic, well, actually, it's more than a year, chronic exhaustion, okay, feelings of energy depletion, increased cynicism. Does anybody, you know, and feel free to use the chat function, has anyone felt increased cynicism over the past 12 to 18 months? You know, whether you want to admit it or not, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so all of this, and I guess I was going to use this as a prompt to pick on somebody, I've got to organize my, um, my grid view or something like that so I can see everybody's name, but that's fine for right now. I keep on hitting the wrong button, sorry about that. Okay, this is all about burnout, essentially. People are burnout, faculty are burnout, students are burnout, and we've still got to go around and around this all over again. So I want to make sure that this is worth your time. I want you to be able to take stuff away from it so that you can then take that into account as you move forward, because this isn't the end of it. We thought COVID was over, perhaps at the start of the summer when the vaccines were being rolled out. Well, now we have to worry about catching the Delta strain and other things like that. So all of the stuff that I want to talk about today is kind of interlinked together. And like I said, this will probably only be about a 40 minute talk and we're already about 10 minutes in. <laughs> but the topics I want to talk about are these three here, leadership, mental health, resilience, all of which sound kind of fluffy. But to be honest, you may be fine, okay? He may be perfectly fine. He may be the toughest person we know. Okay? But if he becomes a faculty member who then has students who aren't doing so fine, it's going to be on him as a leader of a research group or a postdoc or in some other position to really take over that. Okay? So all of that. So I'm, I'm curious. You know, he, Here's a chance where I, I get to look through my list. So I've got a few questions. It was going to be polls but that was a bit too much uh, to get to work. So here's a photo of my lab, some of my students from a couple of years ago. What are the traits of a good leader? And when have you needed to be a leader? Okay. You can think about times. Um, now I get to look through the list. Oh, I see John. John, are you still there, mate? John Omnick. Hey. Yeah, you. Have you ever needed to be a leader, John? Uh, yes. When? Uh, I constantly for my work in Alaska. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Who else is on the list here? Uh, I won't pick on too many people, but, but yeah, thanks, John. I really appreciate that. Yeah, there's going to be all sorts of chimes, opportunities where you've got to be a leader, and it may not be in academic, okay? There's all sorts of possibilities. It could be for work. Okay, but it could also be that you've been on a team, that you've worked at a group project, um, maybe you volunteer with a church, or you've got something else. Maybe you've got five siblings who, whether you're the oldest, you kind of have to be the leader. So when we start to talk about what leadership means, I mean, a lot of us are going to have opinions. All of us are going to have opinions. That's the best part about this particular kind of talk. We all have opinions on what it means to be a good leader and, and sort of the what that should sort of be how a leader should lead 
And I have this quote down here. We often think, especially, you know, with the, the concept of leadership, because it's perceived in different countries, sometimes the leader talks a lot and sometimes they don't. Okay. And that's a very important difference culturally. Okay. Sometimes the leader is the person who's just always listening. Okay. And then helps make the decision. So when you're going to be pushed, and you will eventually be pushed because you're going to be seniors or grad students, or you're going to be going off to your careers, there's all sorts of things that people can suggest. And this talk, this was the, 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 the part of the talk where Laura, uh, one of my students, was actually going to talk about her experiences. And so you'll see that throughout this talk here. And all of these photos, just in case you're wondering, these are all people I work with. Um, there on the right-hand side, that's Professor Raja Sekaran, and he's great. He's a fantastic professor, and he's a leader of his group. All of these things might be something that you know about already, or stuff that you feel like, oh, yeah, okay, maybe I should do this. And, of course, it's easy to give good advice and totally understand that sometimes it takes more effort to actually accept the good advice sort of thing. So in terms of being a leader, sometimes you've got to delegate. In my lab, there is doing the glass work, okay? We're a synthesis materials lab, and sometimes you've got to do, the glass work is very peaceful and it doesn't require much brain power. So I always volunteer to do the glass work. Is it the best thing I could should and should be doing? Probably not. And so that also comes into sort of prioritizing what you need to do. And some people, me as an undergrad, went through life blithely just doing tasks as I felt like doing them. So maybe prioritizing is perhaps a better way to go about approaching that. And that's probably true of all sorts of approaches and not just from there. Now, the other advantage that you have, which I certainly never had, was that you are able to reach out to people. You've got people who are delegated to actually wanting to help you. Okay. Now, that's particularly true at the stage of the career that you're all at. I mean, I think everybody here, and Russ can help confirm, everybody here is an undergrad. We don't have any grad students yet, do we? That is correct. Everybody all right, is sweet. Grad. Yeah, so I guess I can already X off the fact that you're already involved with an REU position, you know. And so you're hopefully already involved in research. You may not have been involved in research yet, but maybe a professor pushed you, said, hey, we've got these REUs, you should totally go in for that. Okay. Making these sort of connections is what is really going to help because as you get better at that particular task, of course, and we're going to talk about that, you know, more and more. I mean, how many people here went in and here's, uh, who, oh, well, there's Marianne. I'll, I'll pick on her just because she's got a video on and I appreciate it. Marianne, how did you get involved in research? Actually, I received an email um, like two days before the application was due informing <laughs> me that there was this um, research opportunity. Gotcha. So I just filled out the email and here was that in like what March or April or something like that? That was in the end of May or the end of May. Yeah. Nice. We started June 7th, I believe. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. Yeah. So no, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so a lot of the time you may just, as we say on the screen, say you you may just get a cold email. It'll be like, hey, you're in my class. And in fact, that's how I managed to recruit one of my students, Laura, is like, wow, she's really good. She's really smart. So it may be that you have that opportunity sort of served to you, or it might be that you actually have to go and seek that out. And so if you are able to make it to office hours, of course, that's been interrupted by, by COVID, then that's an excellent way because whether you intend to go on to grad school or go to medical school or PA school, you're going to need people who can write for you. You're going to need people who can advocate and say, yeah, John is fantastic and I really want him to go into grad school and this is why I should hire John or Marianne or anybody else. So a lot of what you're doing right now, and this is why I like this so much, the fact that I get to speak to everybody because hopefully what you're doing is you're working on a set of skills, set of techniques that you get to do again and again and again. 
I assume that there is probably some task, and I'm actually up now at BYU, um, up at Brigham Young University, up in Utah, so I'm on a slightly different time zone, and I'm having the opportunity to catch up with my graduate student who's here, and she's been looking at these fiber optic pieces, and she has been doing the same couple of processes again and again and again. And so she's been mastering these skills. She may go on to using those skills, Okay, but whatever she does, she becomes better at that. There's the old joke. Um, I don't, it's so old, in fact, many of you may not have heard it. How do you, you know, you, there's a guy in New York and he says, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And what's the answer? Practice, practice, practice. You know, he's obviously asking for directions, but of course, Carnegie Hall is where they put on symphonies and that sort of thing. So all of this is going to be a chance where you work with people Okay, so that's the ideal thing. We want to make you better. And that's something that I never had. I can't speak to when Russ, Russ has only just graduated, young guy that he is. Okay. <laughs> okay, but that's the thing, creating these connections, creating a network that's going to help you out. So this is all part of this leadership goal, these activities that we want to work towards. The person there in the picture wearing the purple vest, that's Janie Ingram. She, uh, she is from the Navajo tribe, and she is one of the smartest, most hardworking people that I know, one of the best leaders. So I just want to give props to her. So what else do we have to know? Discipline. Boo. Yeah. Uh, discipline is a muscle that has to be exercised. And I wish I had, it's not that I wish I had known that as an undergrad, but I wish somebody had kept on pushing me at that. But the simple reason is that discipline, just like anything, needs it needs work, okay? You can say, oh, I don't feel like doing stuff today. And that is absolutely me. And in fact, I've been incredibly productive because I've been up here in Utah because I don't have all of the distractions. I can't wander down to my laboratory and do the glassware. I can't go and chit chat with the secretary. But all of these are things that you can take into account. And a lot of it I know sounds silly and redundant and possibly you've heard before in terms of like, let me give you some good advice kind of thing. Okay. But all of these things are these components that we want you to help develop because of course, you're going to be leaders, okay, having had this opportunity. And however you got here, that's perfectly fine. Whether somebody reached out to you just a couple of days or whether somebody was preparing you for this for months. So know that you're not going to be perfect, okay? All of us are going to be distracted by, I don't know, video games or family or life or being outside in the sun when we should be in the lab bashing away at a computer. And that's okay. And we're going to talk about that as well. You know, it's, it's easy to talk about these broad brush strokes and not talk about sort of the nitty gritty of what really happens. Okay, I better, I better move along because I, I keep got to keep an eye on my time because I know, of course, you lovely people want to eat lunch when you get the chance to. So, so we talked about leadership. Now, I talked about burnout when I first introduced all these slides here, okay? Because I felt that all three of these things were kind of related to each other. And that's really what I wanted to cover. I could have covered mental health in just one entire lecture on its own, of course, but you know, I wanted to cover these others as well. So let's talk about that. Mental health of undergraduates or graduates is a huge deal. It is a huge deal because this is a particularly tough discipline to go into and whether that is going into research, becoming a graduate student, following an academic track, a lot of what the what they call perverse incentives, incentives that are like, oh, if I stay up till midnight and get up at 5 a.m., I can get more work done. Okay. And of course, you can get by without sleep for a while. It's like, oh, I'll just eat a hamburger rather than something healthy. But a lot of this is, like I said, these perverse incentives where academic success is prioritized over the things that actually keep us functional. And that includes not just mental health, but connections with family, connections with friends, healthy lifestyle. So all of this links together. And that's why I couldn't separate out leadership from mental health, from resilience. So 
I want all of you to pursue your goals, whatever those might be. And, and that's a great place where I can start to pick on people, okay, and ask, well, what are your goals? I mean, I see um, I've got uh, Nathaniel down there at the bottom of my screen. Nathaniel, what is your goal? You're an RU student now. Do you think you might go on to graduate school later on, perhaps? We'll see if um, yeah, there. I uh, I think I, I'd like to go to grad school. Um, I'm considering the accelerated master's program here at U of A, hey, um, nice. but I'm also looking around at other grad schools too. So, right, okay. Would you say as an undergrad, it's been a real easy ride? Uh, I don't know about easy ride, but it's been it's been it's been good, and I have I can't complain much. So that's okay. That's okay. That is great. I mean, that's the thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, sometimes we have periods where we go through and everything is fine. And other times, and for other people, we go through and things are absolute disaster and not often through any choice of our own. Maybe we get sick. Maybe we have family strife, okay? So each of us has our own challenges, okay? I'm not going to make presumptions based on my experience that somebody else hasn't had, say, a chronic health condition or somebody in their family who's recently passed away, or perhaps they're struggling because they have a roommate who is just the worst. Okay, so all of these things are going to be challenges that the rest of us may never see. And so that's important. That's, from my perspective, the reason why I try to be kind, because I don't know what other people are going through. So if we're talking about this, what are stresses for people. I picked this particular picture, you know, I've got all these images from NAU and I particularly picked this particular one of this big old syringe. I'm sure it's used for inoculating cells or something like that because, hey, sometimes people get stressed out by needles. This was where I was going to have these re responses, these polls sort of thing. I don't know whether anyone's got fear of needles or something like that, but, but what's something that stresses you out? What's something that stresses people out, maybe generally, or specifically in your case? Does anyone want to sort of contribute or hop in? I, I, don't, I don't care for needles myself. I can't watch them go in. That's the only thing. Oh, I see a chat message. Uh, deadlines. Thanks, Samar. Yeah, absolutely. Deadlines, for sure. Yeah, so big tests. Yeah, and this is perfectly understandable. I mean, you're all at the level of, I think most of you are probably juniors, right? You know, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a few sophomores or seniors in there. Yeah, deadlines, tests, tough professors. Oh, the professors are just the worst, I'll admit. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, all of these things. The funny thing, of course, with tough professors is sometimes they are real pieces of work at saying that as a professor. And sometimes once you get to know them, they're a lot less intimidating sort of thing. You can't tell, but uh, I'm about six foot tall. And when I go to lecture, I, I dress up and I wear heels. So of course that makes me even taller again, sort of thing. So, so yeah, a lot of people say that, oh, you were really, you were really intimidating until I got to know you. And so I have mixed feelings about that one. So yeah, no, thank you so much. Online, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's a good one. What do you, Nathaniel, if I can explore that, What's the stressful part about online classes? Sorry, um, just, I mean, just generally just finding the motivation to like go to them all the time. And um, it's just generally, it's harder to learn with mm -hmm. online classes, I think. Um, yeah. And also just sometimes, uh, you know, professors think that because classes are online, that means that they can give more assignments and more homework, um, which is not necessarily true because we still have other things, but. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks so much. Yeah, I did my very first online class. It was an online class for Chem 130. It was an online freshman chemistry class. Get this at 8 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, they're, they're, to suffice to say, it was hard to motivate people for sure. But yeah, no, absolutely. It's hard to learn. So yeah, so these are great. Thank you so much, everybody. So if we're talking about what stresses us out, we want to understand, okay, well, what can we do? And everybody's gonna have a different approach, okay? A lot of it is just going to be like, hey, you know, if, if this is something that puts stress on you, know that, or know that about yourself, okay? 
I put this one first, learning to say no, because I am absolutely horrible at this. And it's possible that it's because I'm sort of some sort of type A type professor who's like ah, all the time. Okay. But a lot of that is learning to say no. No, I can't give this talk. Oh, wait, I'm giving it. Oh, no, I can't do that report. Oh, wait, I'm writing it. Oh, no, I can't write this letter sort of thing. So a lot of it is about setting, setting boundaries, you know, being realistic. And a lot of it is, and this is why I'm so happy people are typing that in, is when you express that, like, yeah, I get freaked out by these professors because they seem really intimidating and I don't know how to approach them, okay, that, that creates stress for you, that there's triggers. I know the term triggered is sort of being a bit, you know, diluted these days. But, yeah, you know, some things, it's just like it can be something as simple as car trips. Car trips in the middle seat. I get road sick, okay? So, yeah, if I know I'm going to be stuck in the middle seat of a road trip, yeah, I'm going to be triggered because I know I'm going to be sick. So as long as you know that about yourself, okay, then that's going to be one way that you can start to start to address that essentially. So once you know that, then you can start being more realistic, okay, and that will help, as we say here on the slide, it'll help you achieve more, it'll help, it won't necessarily prevent stress, but maybe circumvent stress, okay, and we talk about that later on when we talk about resilience, okay, a lot of this is setting those goals. And I know it sounds silly, but just writing them down. Again, I wish that's something that I had. I wouldn't have said I would have listened to it, but at least if I'd heard it when I, when I was an undergrad, maybe I would have internalized it more. It's just writing stuff down. Like, okay, what's the number one thing that I have to get done today? What is the most critical thing, which is giving this talk and getting to BYU at, a, at the correct time, okay? All of that is going to help you sort of not just actually accomplish those goals, but accomplish more than what perhaps you thought you could because of the way you structured it. Of course, the worst part is, at least for me, and maybe some of you uh, will get this, is sort of the circular stress. Does anyone know what I mean when I say circular stress? Oh, I'm stressed out about this deadline. So does that make me more productive or less productive? I'm less productive. So does that mean I'm closer to my goal of accomplishing my deadline or further away? Yeah, further away, because I'm too worried. Of, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, excellent, Marianne, perfect, yeah. And that's the worst part. It's just like, there's a tiny little portion of the upper part of your brain that's like saying, just get started, just get started kind of thing. And the rest of you, at least for me, is like kind of frozen sort of thing. So at least if I start something, I feel progress and then the momentum starts to build. So yeah, no, definitely. And that's a lot about knowing ourselves, which is important. So there was a really great talk. Many of you may not have had the chance to have it. Um, I don't think it was recorded um, back in the January retreat, but it was about imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome, it was funny. When we proposed giving this talk on imposter syndrome, there were these faculty from these tier one institutions, I'm not going to name names, who said, what the hell is imposter syndrome? These are, um, you know, let, let's just say classic academics who've, never felt like an imposter in their entire life, okay, where they don't feel people suffering from imposter syndrome, don't feel or don't recognize, don't own the accomplishments that they have. Um, you know, start with the lowest bar. All of us here, and I haven't picked on everybody yet, have survived COVID. Round of freaking applause for that. We have survived the pandemic, okay? We are all mostly still here. Okay, that's an accomplishment in its own right. And it may seem trivial. It's just like, you know what? I got up this morning, I put pants on, I got into work and I'm here at a talk. Okay, fantastic. Celebrate that, own that. Especially at this time where honestly, putting on pants and getting to a talk is, you know, should be celebrated. But don't stop there, of course. So the reason we wanted to give this talk on imposter syndrome, that was the one back in January, is to make sure people knew that they belonged, knew that they weren't alone. A lot of people 
are coming from backgrounds that we don't even know about. So for example, me, I come from the rural part of Australia, out in what's called the bush, the back of beyond. There are people who are in my lab, people who are at NAU, who come from the reservation, the Navajo reservation specifically. And they are from a very different background than what we other people have been exposed to. And it can be extremely isolating. And it doesn't have to be isolating because of geographically where you're from. It can be isolating to know I'm the only person who has ever gone to college in my family. No one else has ever gone. And they're all saying, why aren't you out there earning, a, a, earning an income when you're getting this degree? So it doesn't have to be isolation from I can't interact or understand these other people. It can be isolation just because of your unique background and who you are. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. The whole point of inclusion is we want you to be able to bring all of you, all of your very best capacity to here. Because when you do that, when you've got that best capacity and you're showing, you're really just like absolutely really working hard and having success. We want you to own that as well. That's really important from a DCI perspective. Okay, I've got to keep my eye on the time. I'm, I'm talking too much. And please, please, if you've got something, a comment, anything, just drop it in the chat. Um, you know, I'd be super happy for that. Um, all of you, if nothing else, you've got Russ, who is a fantastic person who you can always reach out to. I'm, I'm going to give a big shout out to him, of course. But you also have each other. Okay, it's because it's all virtual. I think it's all virtual. Is that correct for us? Yeah. Every... The some of them are actually in labs, so they do have physical contact with mentors. But in terms of each other, it is virtual. So, and we we do a meeting once a week with everybody, give everybody a chance to talk and mm -hmm. tell updates and successes and challenges. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. We want you to have that opportunity. I I. I don't want to pick on people who are like sitting in the audience saying, oh, God, please don't pick on me. Please don't pick on me. But I want to make sure that you have that opportunity to talk with people. OK, that's the communication is key part, because honestly, it can be a real tough experience. COVID has isolated all of us from each other. And we want to make sure that you, as we say here, that, you, you know, that you feel seen, that you feel heard, that you, you know, that you're recognized for the qualities that you bring here. So all of this is uh, techniques, approaches that you can use to keep yourself bouncing back from tough times. And that's kind of towards the end of the talk here. I've still got a few more slides. Okay is having something that you can go to, okay? This, this is the easy question for, for chats or for, uh, you know, for feedback. All right, what are your hobbies? Clearly, you are not all in the lab 24-7. What do you do, okay, when it's just like, oh, man, okay, dinner is done, I'm home, I don't have to study. What do you do to relax, okay? What do you do to relax? I'm going to type mine into the chat. Um, uh, there we go. Um, you know, uh, nice. Oh, yeah, that's right. We had so many musicians. What? Okay, Russ. All right. Russ put disc golf and pickleball. What the freaking hell is pickleball? I've brought this up a couple of times. Um, I think he knows what it is a little bit because him and I have talked about it. Uh, it's kind of a combination between tennis, badminton, and uh, what's the other one that usually play like tennis. ping pong? Because <laughs> you're using a it's a racket sport where it's a it's a closed face paddle, no strings. You're using a very light ball like a wiffle ball, and then it's a ground net on a smaller court than a tennis court okay all so. right okay but it's not an olympic olympic pickleball is not an option yet uh you know what i would not be surprised with how fast it's growing that in four years um i would be surprised if it's not so. all right fair enough okay yeah no there's some great ones here we've got nathaniel who said traveling i think he was like in a picture from uh looks like maybe he's at the snow or something like that 
you know, listen to music from Joe Woon. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so everybody's got something. You know, I play, my, my problem is, of course, is that playing the switch isn't exactly good from it you know, an exercise going outside perspective, but, you know, it's relaxing, okay? So, yeah, so whatever you've got, and it could be any of these, I, I think we got many, but not necessarily all of these, you know, whether it's, you know, napping is relaxation, exercise is relaxation. All of what I think we recognise here is that we can't go 24-7. We cannot always be switched on. And, in fact, it's probably problematic, you know, to be switched on and trying to give 100% all the time. So a lot of what we're talking about here when we talk about mental health and moving into resilience is things that help you cope when not everything is going right. Because, of course, sometimes when you have one success, one win, you go on and have another win after that. Okay, but, but sometimes you can't always do that 100%. And so people have got different things that work for them. And, you know, all of these, I think we recognize to a certain extent, I, you know, pickleball, maybe less so, but that's okay. You know, so what about stresses for after college? We had a lot of good people talking about, oh, you know, professors scare me and, or some professors scare me and then exams, of course. What about after college? Okay. Because a lot of the techniques and how much technique can I give you in 40 minutes sort of thing, what about after college? Okay. Are there things that worry people like, I don't know, getting into the grad school I want or paying back those student loans or, you know, for me being, I don't know, kicked out of a country if I ever lose my job sort of thing. What are, what are stresses for people after college? Okay. Graduate school? Who haven't I picked on? Uh, I've got Brianne, I've got Abby, I've got uh, Joe Woon, I've got a couple of people here, Samar. What are people's stresses for after college? You can feel free to type those into the chat or you can just turn on your audio if you want. <laughs> Nice. I like Mary Ann's answer. It's just like, yeah, I'm not thinking about it. We'll deal with it when we get there. You know, that's great. Yeah, getting a job. Okay. Or, you know, Eat was talking earlier about graduate school, of course. You know, I, I figure, Eat, that you've got a priority list. You talked about U of A, of course. Crazy rent prices. Yeah. So, no, all of these are exactly the same. So, Whatever these skills are that you develop as you go through undergrad, know that you are, these are things that you can take advantage of afterwards because stress will not stop. Yeah, the rent prices are absolutely ridiculous. I thought Phoenix was cheap and Tucson, you know, as well. But no, it's, it's, it's absolutely bizarre. Okay. So, yeah, so all of this stuff is things that you can work on, okay? Now, there's a lot of stuff here that I fully understand as someone who is a scientist, as someone who is a professor, sounds, for lack of a better word, fluffy, okay? It's just like, oh, it's all touchy-feely, and it's just like, oh, mindfulness, you know, you know, that's okay. I totally understand that it sounds fluffy, but if it's common wisdom, perhaps it's because there's a certain degree of truth for it, okay? keeping mindful about what the priority is, okay? If for some reason I was to forget, I would be mortified, by the way, if I forgot to give this talk this morning. In fact, I had actually thought I'd screwed up the time zones and I said, oh, it's at 11. But that's because the hours are the other way. And Russ thankfully corrected me. It would not have been the end of the world sort of thing, okay? And you will eventually find a job, all of you. And the reason I know this is because I know what the employment rate is for people with degrees, particularly STEM degrees. All of this is not going to happen instantaneously and being told it's going to be fine. Has anyone ever felt better, okay, being told it's going to be fine? Has, it, has that ever worked for anybody ever? Never, as far as I'm aware. Don't tell me it's fine. I don't want to hear it sort of thing. So, so yeah, 
know that you've got people out there who are going to be your advocates, that you've got REU mentors and other professors who will write letters for you and that you will get a job and the job will probably cover the rent, okay? But you're also only one person, okay? The important thing about having a chance to talk with each other is because you're only one person, you have people you can fall back on. You know, it can be like, hey, Abby, what was that talk about mental health, leadership and resilience all about today? And Abby can tell somebody else who isn't here, oh, it was, it was okay. You know, some professor from NAU came and talked about leadership and mindfulness and how everything's going to be fine. I don't know, stuff like that. So all of this is, you know, stuff that we want you to know. We specifically want you to know this because of that reason that we want you to feel included. We want you to know that there is somebody, specifically me and our other leaders, who want you to be okay, who want you to have people you can reach out to. So having talked about leadership and mental health, we come to this last point here, and I've got about half a dozen slides, so I'll speed up. Resilience, what is it? Okay, I cannot make problems go away. Okay, I cannot produce the rent in Tucson or Phoenix. I cannot promise uh, that your grad school of choice is going to be the one you're going to get into. Okay, but even though it won't make the problem go away, it'll help you adapt. Okay, all of us are going to have these difficult situations, these challenges. And the important thing is, is that it can help you build your confidence, that if you get knocked down, that you get back up. And I know that sounds trite, but when you get a paper rejected, it hurts. When you get a grant kicked back and they didn't think it was very good, that sucks, okay? All of these things are going to be happening to us, whether it's in academia or as just individuals living our lives. Okay? So we want you to know that you've got support. You've got people who are willing to look out for you. And hopefully you've got that not just in the learning environments, university, community college, graduate school, but at home as well. So all of that is helping you not to make the problems go away, but helping you to adapt to stress. And that's, that's important for us to express to you. Academic resilience. I won't go into the free response here because I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on the time. I, I see it's um, 1.45 where I am, 12.45 for most people. So I'm just going to hop past this. Of course, you can think, well, what is academic resilience? You know, when somebody gets, holy cow, I got an F on that exam, or I got a 2 out of 10, or I got this really snippy note from the TA, that you don't internalize that and it stops your momentum, that you take that and move forward. So. A lot of this, you know, sounds, sounds kind of maybe not trite, but, but, you know, kind of fluffy, okay? Keep in mind that not everything can be done at one time, okay? That if you do your best, your honest best, then that will often be more than enough. They say that 50% of the things is just turning up. Yes, you have to put some work in there, but if you turn up on day to day, okay, that's a pretty good start. Okay? People say never, ever, ever give up sort of thing. And well, I have mixed feelings on that, you know, because if something hasn't worked and you've done it 50 times, is it going to work on the 51st time? Hmm, I, I wouldn't put odds on it, put it that way. Okay, so be kind to yourself, okay? But do good work regardless. Okay, don't lose sight of your goals. The thing is, a lot of people, and I'm especially guilty of this, don't actually have goals set out, okay? This is uh, winter in Flagstaff. This is Louis the lumberjack covered in snow here on your left. Maybe you're familiar with Louis or not. But the thing is, have your goals. Oh, you want to get into this graduate school? Okay, make that happen. How are you going to accomplish that? What are the steps you're going to take to make sure that not only you know what your goal is, but you articulate that? And that's the one thing for homework that I'd hope people would do is that they would write down what is my goal for today, for, I don't know, for lunch, for whatever it might be, that ah, my goal is to get into MIT. All right, great. How am I going to make that happen? What is it? Enunciate it, express it. Okay, my goal is to find a good job. Well, what do you mean by a good job? Okay, so 
all of this is what we are trying to help you accomplish here. How do you bounce back? Like I said, this was going to be another free response. Um, I've talked too much, you know, which is a classic academic trait, of course. Okay. What do you do when you get that bad report? What do you do when you get that, I don't know, that less than still a grade on the exam? Okay. All of this to use the term is what we call metacognition. And in fact, I'm going to type that into the chat here, metacognition. Cognition is just how you think. Metacognition is thinking about how you think. Metacognition is like, hey, I've noticed that when I have a setback, my brain then tries to sabotage me the next time around, okay? Metacognition is being aware of what your part of your brain is trying to do and finding a way around it. Okay? And a lot of that is about resilience, how you bounce back from things. So I won't go into too much more detail here. A lot of it is mindset. You know, um, I tend to be more cynical than optimistic. I mean, maybe I, maybe I disguise by calling it, I'm just a realist, okay? But that's the thing, you know, it can be it can be toxic, it can be corrosive, okay? and it can affect how your outlook on life is. And especially we carry a lot of baggage with us from our family, from our upbringing and everything else. But all of these things we want you to know, you wouldn't be here if we didn't think you had potential and recognize that and made you go with mentors who we could think could unlock that as well. So mindset is a huge part of this, being adaptable, being flexible, okay? I really respect people who not only do REU experiences, but go to REU experiences miles away from thousands of miles across the country from where they live, okay? Because that's a really brave thing to do. People say, oh, it must have been brave of you to come all the way from Australia to the US. And I'm like, I guess. Okay, but I, I really do want people to know that that is something that really is pushing you outside of your comfort zone. Okay, all of this, hey, look, there's me in the lab, you know, uh, all, all of this, of course, you know, is all about when we talk about resilience, we talk about stress, this is healthy stress. Stress, of course, can be toxic, it can be corrosive, it can bring us down, it can impact us, it can give us ulcers and sleeplessness and you know, you wake up at 3 a.m. and say, ah, oh, that report sort of thing. But all of this is because we think as a center, okay, as people involved with education, with workforce development, with diversity, with cultural inclusion, that you have this amazing potential that can be unlocked. Okay. I haven't had the chance to get to know you, but of course, you can always reach out to talk with me and, and hopefully I'll get a chance to know you better that way. All of these things are not bad, okay? It's just that we have to find out what the effective mechanism is for us. And for me, it's going to be different to what it is to say Marianne, or it's going to be different to Samar or Keegan, okay? So all of you are really just gonna to have to sort of figure this out as you go through. Okay, I promise I, I'm, I'm nearly done here, okay? All right, burnout. Okay, this is really the last thing I majorly want to talk about. Burnout, especially after COVID, is just absolutely widespread. Okay, don't, I think the most important point here is probably point two. Don't think that because you're suffering from burnout that somehow that is failure. Okay, the fact that any of us have survived COVID is something to be applauded, something to be cheered. And if some people have done better than us, that's okay, I'm not gonna compare myself because I had to deal with taking care of kids at home and finding an internet connection when there wasn't one on the reservation, or I had other things that impacted that. A lot of this is just normalizing these conversations and that can be difficult to talk about mental health because sometimes it's tough to say to somebody, hey, I'm having a rough time here, okay? And hopefully if somebody does have that conversation with you about mental health, that you really sort of, you know, take that seriously because it's something that's pretty tough to bring up. Okay. And, you know, hopefully rather than being alone, 
okay, we can make that happen. And it's difficult, at least from my perspective, just to share a little bit. I'm from Australia, all my family is back in Australia. I haven't been able to go back and see them in about, well, two and a half years now because of COVID. Um, COVID is now starting to tear Australia up. So I worry about my family. Of course, my parents are older. They haven't had vaccines because the vaccine system has been all screwed up. And so that brings a lot of stress, okay? But talking about it makes a big difference. Okay, last little bit, okay, academia. Okay, it's not a sprint. It's, it's not even a marathon. It's an ultra marathon for people who aren't willing to just do a marathon. You know, I'm from Flagstaff. We have all these crazy runners who train there. I'm in Provo right now. We have more of these crazy runners. But all of this is really, to use that analogy, but you need to pace yourself. Okay, pace yourself, be kind to yourself, and be kind to others and help them when you can. Okay. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. This was going to be more open-ended. I've talked too long already, okay? But if you see something, feel free, you know, we'll have, you know, there's a chance to ask questions here at the end. I've got to keep an eye on the time because it's nearly, uh, nearly time for the hour, okay? We talked about these three topics. That's really what I want you to take away from today. We have in the center an entire group of people, the diversity and culture of inclusion, who wanna make sure that you feel welcomed Okay. And you'll get a chance to have feedback, you know, later on this year. Be like, hey, do you know what the DCI is? Oh, that's that woman who came and gave the talk on with all the pictures of Flagstar. It's like, yeah, that's us. Okay. So all of these things are really, really key. It's not quantum. It's not even, you know, the, uh, the IOU program, but we think it's really important. So there's my... Uh, you know, my email and my phone number if you want to reach out, if you have any questions, comments, uh, inspirational quote to go about your day. I, I realize we're short on time, and so I apologize, Russ, for that. Um, but yeah, you know, are there any questions before I call it good for the day? That's okay. Russ warned me that the group might be quiet, and that's okay. That's all right. The main thing that I want you to take away and internalize is just that at this center, we have people who care about the fact that you have your own stuff that you're bringing here, and we want you to be, feel free to have a chance to talk about that if you feel comfortable. We're not going to make you talk about it if you don't. So, And they know they can always email me. They have your email, or if they yes. don't get it, they can email me for your email. <laughs> so yep, not a problem at all. Now. Yeah, that's okay. I understand that this is kind of like the, the lunch hour. People are shoving down sandwiches and drinking coffee and taking a break. And it's just like, oh, we're forced to attend this thing. But that's okay. Because you can tell, you know, I'm excited to talk about this kind of stuff because I feel it's really important. Honestly, I'm a researcher at heart, but I've been through some tough times myself. And that's why I feel it's important to sort of pay this forward. So, yeah. Well, if there's... Any no. Any announcements that you have to make, Russ, before we all hop off? No, other than wanting to thank you. Um, and it was a great talk. I really appreciated it, just even for myself hearing a lot of that. So um, it's yeah. very, very valuable. So thank you again. Um, if you slept through it or you were eating lunch or you're in the food line, of course, it'll be recorded and posted uh, on the YouTube channel. And again, you know, feel free to reach out uh, anytime.